Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm Rachel Asenis, and this is Inside Santa Barbara, the news magazine that takes you inside the city's most important projects, issues, and events. Today we are coming to you from the County Courthouse Sunken Gardens. Perhaps the city's most recognizable landmark, the courthouse was completed in 1929 and illustrates the beauty of Spanish colonial revival architecture. Recently, hundreds of youth came here to the county courthouse with the hopes of achieving one thing, empowerment. In our top story, we go inside a community-based process that aims to empower youth to create change. Growing up often means growing pains. Teens face many challenges like peer pressure and fitting in. Bullying is also a common issue among teens. According to a national survey, 30 percent or over 5.7 million youth are estimated to be involved in bullying as either a bully, a target of bullying, or both. In a survey of students in grades 6 through 10, 13 percent reported bullying others, 11 percent reported being the target of school bullies, and another 6 percent said they bullied others and were bullied themselves. Here in Santa Barbara, students share with us the kind of bullying they see at school. When I was in sixth grade, one of my friends thought it was funny to grab some scissors and put it near someone's face, like closing them and opening them. And like my friend didn't like that person, so she thought it was funny, and she actually cut herself. She actually cut it right here, and I, I felt bad for her because I'm like she was like smaller than her, so I'm like, why would you be picking on someone that's like half your size? And that got me mad, and that's when I stopped talking to her. And I'm like, it's time to grow up, like, because you wouldn't like it if you were going through it. You were smaller than somebody else, and someone just came up to you and did something to you, so. But as we learn through their stories, bullying can take on different forms. Not so much anymore as in, like, the classical sense of, like, a bigger kid picking on a smaller kid, because there's so many security guards and stuff at a school. It's more of, like, emotional bullying and kind of, like, exclusional bullying. You know, I see a lot of kids isolated from groups. I see a lot of kids teased for certain things, and I see, I do see a lot of bullying, and I do see, I was bullied in elementary school, so I know how that feels, and I know how it feels to be, like, isolated from the main group, and it's really hurtful, so I do see a lot of it, and I really feel for those kids. Adults feel for them as well. It takes them back to their own experiences. For me, it was, it was horrible. I was bullied almost every day in elementary school by a couple of guys. Um, one of them I, I hang around with now is an adult. You know, he, he can't believe he used to do that to me. Uh, and it turns out he came from a substance abuse home, both mother and father. He was frustrated. Uh, he was bullied at home. Later on, we figured out he was just acting his anger out on other people, and I was the easiest target. Bullying can have long-term effects that follow young people into adulthood, like domestic violence or negative dating. Bullies are four times more likely than non-bullies to be convicted of crimes by the age of 24. According to a local survey, out of 900 Dos Pueblos high school students, 32 percent reported feeling a caring school climate, and only 18 percent felt that our community values them. Only 29 percent felt they had positive adult role models. Organizers of one local project are hoping to help increase those numbers. Introducing Santa Barbara's first anti-bullying summit, hosted by the Youth Outreach Programs branch of the Channel Islands YMCA. It is part of a six-month anti-bullying campaign at four local secondary schools. Our goal is to bring uh, community leaders, adults, teachers, educators, and teens together to work towards uh, creating a safer environment everywhere in Santa Barbara. But what makes this event so unique is its role reversal, where students speak and teachers listen. And for educators, you know, we're usually in front of the students and talking to them. For us to hear them, and see what we can do to help that among other students is really important to me. And one goal of the anti-bullying project is to foster relationships between adults and youth, relationships both educators and students say are important. So with adults listening, teens spoke on student panels as well as participated in breakout sessions with specific anti-bullying topics, like the types and effects of bias, racism, and violence, coping strategies, and using expressive arts as an emotional outlet. Open the gate up, open the gate up, hooray! Open and 
as some students express their feelings by singing their favorite tunes, others show their feelings through poems, like this one from a student at Las Alturas High School. Homies for life, that's what everyone says. But when you get caught up, how many of them stay? You have fun times while you're doing all your crimes. When you get beat up, your homies say, stay up. So someone heard something about you, and he ran and told your whole crew. Now all your so-called homies say they hate you. The poem is evidence that the recent gang stabbing in downtown that left a 15-year-old El Puente High School boy dead is still fresh in the minds of local youth. In light of what happened on State Street, this youth summit's even more important. Um, it's important for us to listen to the young people and see what they're thinking. Uh, it's a shame that we're seeing across the country more and more violence from younger and younger people. So the timing of the summit is perfect. And we should talk about it. We should never stop talking about it because it's reality. It happened and it could happen again. We're hoping that it doesn't. So really the summit is going to give us an opportunity, both the city in general, council and mayor and myself, to talk about these realities that we saw on State Street. And such realities gave way to negative generalizations about teens. But many believe teen stereotypes are only misconceptions. They are incredibly um, able to take more of a leadership role and I think that's really part of the theme of this is empowering them to know that you can really uh, take a lead and you can speak up. We want to hear your voices. And their voices are being heard. Growing up doesn't have to mean growing pains. As we've seen with the Empowering Youth to Create Change Summit, it's what you do with those growing pains that make all the difference. Each teen we spoke to voiced their definitions of empowerment. Empowering means to live above the bad influence. Empowerment means stepping out of your comfort zone in order to achieve something greater than you would normally do on an everyday basis. Empowerment means like step up, you know, uh, you know don't disrespect, always um, do the right thing. It means doing something that's hard and that you know will promote good things and promote change. Empowerment's like, like a sense from within that you know you can do what you have to do. Having the power within yourself to kind of step outside of the box and become your own person, have your own mind. Empowerment means getting everyone together as a whole and creating more ideas and forcing that and trying to create more change. And local teens will get another chance to become empowered. The Santa Barbara Parks and Recreation Department is hosting a Teen Speak Out event this month. For all the details, go to our website, citytv18.com. Well, this courthouse was completed in 1929, four years after the 1925 earthquake destroyed the old courthouse. As a matter of fact, these walls are the foundation of the basement of the original courthouse. And as that earthquake has proven, Santa Barbara is not immune to disasters. In our next story, Delina Michael shows us how many residents now know what to do in the event of such a disaster, specifically a fast-moving wildfire. This is the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department with a voluntary evacuation drill. If you only had minutes to get out of your house, what would you save? That was the question put before the residents of Santa Barbara's Riviera on Saturday, April 25th. The drill is commencing, 0900, the Riviera evacuation drill is commencing. This is a drill. With that announcement over walkie-talkies, a fire evacuation drill began promptly at 9 a.m. on an overcast morning. This was one Saturday not to sleep in. Besides the bullhorn, Riviera residents learned of the start of the drill with a reverse 911 call, where the phone rings and an automated message prompts with instructions for evacuating. We got a call at 9.06 a.m. to evacuate, and we've been very involved in this process of getting this to happen because what's important is that we don't pay attention to just structures, but people. People are more important than structures. All Riviera residents had been notified of the drill during the weeks leading up to it. They had received door-to-door -door visits, numerous mailings, and signage was posted around the area. Well, we kind of packed up a little bit last night. You know, we got all the notices, saw all the signs, and uh, just were pretty prepared for it, you know. 
The drill was put on by the City of Santa Barbara Fire Department and the Riviera Homeowners Association, along with 17 other government and volunteer agencies. With volunteers in place at six different traffic control points, cars began streaming down the hillside. Well, actually, it looks a lot busier now than it did just a minute ago. Um, and I think you don't really know what, uh, what an evacuation is going to be like unless you've tried it. Even kids were able to recognize the importance of a drill. If there was a fire and we didn't practice, we wouldn't really know what to do. Indeed, the drill served two purposes, a chance for both residents and emergency service providers to see a realistic view of the potential impacts an evacuation could have in the neighborhood. As people are evacuating the area, we're always trying to get our engines and resources in. So that was the, the idea behind sending engines in, to see what kind of resistance they're going to get going into these areas. The drill area stretched from Los Olivos on the west to Sycamore Canyon Road on the east, and from Las Canoas on the north down to Alameda Padre Serra. We want to see where the pinch points are, where the traffic control problems are, and without the residents getting in the car and actually driving out of the Riviera, we won't be able to really see where the impact zones are. The drill included five search and rescue teams and fire engines from Santa Barbara City and County, Montecito, and Carpinteria. The Riviera definitely has the fuel uh, for fire. And uh, when we have our sundowners and the conditions are right, it's just, uh, it's just a, a time bomb. It could really be an explosive event. We're at the corner of Moreno and APS, which was one of six traffic control checkpoints for this evacuation drill. Now, residents have been streaming down this road all morning. They've been filling out these green tickets to let us know what time they learned of the evacuation and the time that they left their house. With 600 residents participating, the drill was a huge success. Two years ago, the city did a drill with residents in the Mission Canyon area with about 300 residents participating. It seems very organized, very orderly, and that makes me feel safe. The drill also brought to light several issues to be aware of in the case of a real disaster. In this very calm drill, people still wanted to talk. They want to know what was up, where to go, etc. And I know that during a disaster, people will want to talk even more. And anyone wanting to talk who's in a car making on an evacuation route is going to slow everything up. So we need to have a process for speeding people along and saying, please go down the hill. Everything can be explained down there. The Fryden family took the drill seriously and had the whole car packed up with kids and pets. I have our three kids and we have two dogs. We're dog sitting um, uh, dogs we brought her to while 100 volunteers from the Boy Scouts, Red Cross, and other local emergency service teams were on hand to help, there was another group of people working behind the scenes. This included city staff who gathered at the Emergency Operations Center at the Santa Barbara Police Station on Figueroa Street. From here, officials were able to monitor what was happening with streaming video from traffic control points and to plan for the next course of action. We're grateful for the many hundreds of people, both fire, police, and professional resources, and also the volunteers who have volunteered their time, both preparing and then going through this uh, practice exercise just to try to bring a higher level of safety preparedness to our community. Of course, when a real fire or other emergency comes, there won't be any time to plan ahead. But this drill did give residents the chance to think about what they would grab if they only had a few minutes. And that's exactly what law enforcement and emergency service agencies wanted to see happen. If you only have five minutes to pack and leave, what items would you take if you had to just run for your life from an actual disaster? So this is really a test of preparedness for the entire community. The Riviera evacuation drill exceeded expectations with 68% of residents participating in the drill. Well, the county courthouse uses what is called a water furnace geothermal system, which burns no fossil fuels and instead uses the free, clean and renewable energy found just below the Earth's surface. A combination of water and antifreeze circulates through buried pipes where it picks up enough warmth to heat the building in cold weather. In warm weather, the process is reversed, providing air conditioning. 
Well, MTD has also recently taken strides to go green, but in the form of transportation. Coming up next, Dominique Blocker tells us why MTD has high hopes for eight shiny new buses. MTD is doing its part to reduce Santa Barbara's traffic congestion and lower its greenhouse gas emissions with the addition of eight new hybrid electric buses. City Council members Mayor Bloom and Congresswoman Lois Capps recently joined other members of the community for an inaugural ride. I just have to seize this moment to congratulate the Metropolitan District of Santa Barbara and to note how many people are in the room sharing in this good news today. I think it's significant that we have representatives from all of our local governments because we all benefit by this. These hybrids will run on a combination of electricity, which is supplied by a battery pack on the roof of the bus, and biodiesel fuel to power the engine in the rear. The actual engine is the same size as those that power regular pickup trucks. Greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, the fuel economy is better, it's obviously a very comfortable bus, smaller engine, all the way around this is going to be an economical thing for us, but most of all, we're putting our money into something that's keeping Santa Barbara green. The new buses aren't the only way MTD is stepping up their environmental focus. This month, Santa Barbara MTD becomes one of the first transit agencies in the nation to use biodiesel fuel. And one of the advantages of uh, biodiesel is not only is it uh, cleaner and renewable, but it also reduces the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that go into the environment. And a hybrid running on biodiesel is one of the cleanest alternative fuel vehicles you can purchase today. This means that Santa Barbara's buses will be running partly on vegetable oils, animal fats, and recycled cooking oils, which is helping them achieve their goal of utilizing renewable fuels and generating less emissions. These advancements, along with their electric shuttles, which are the largest battery-powered fleet in the country, are all helping to make Santa Barbara MTD a national leader in sustainable transportation. Because of MTD and what you've been doing over these years, we have 17,000 fewer cars on the road every day. Um, that is amazing. Hop on one of the new hybrid buses on local routes 1, 2, and 20. For more information or a personalized trip planner, visit sbmtd.gov. Well, later on this month, cities across America will celebrate National Public Works Week. Brooke Hawkins shows us how our city's Public Works Department is moving people forward. From every toilet you flush to the smooth roads you drive on, the Public Works Department plays an important role in helping to move life forward for the people of Santa Barbara. Public Works is committed to improving the quality of life in our city, but often much of the work that is done by this important city department is taken for granted. We pretty much don't want to be known because if, if we are known, then they know that you know, something's, something, something's wrong. We still provide the basic core services to the community. We provide water for people to drink and use. We, we provide the wastewater treatment services, which are important, maintain access to the streets as well. The same basic services that we needed from the beginning and provided since the, the city was founded. It's the heart of the city. It's the streets, the infrastructure of the streets, the water and the wastewater that sometimes people take for granted and expect. But what we do is we sustain the smooth driving to work, we sustain the, the clean water when you open your taps, and we sustain the water being treated when you flush it down the toilet and going out to the ocean. So we play a vital role in sustaining the beauty here in, in Santa Barbara. The department consists of four capital programs, engineering, transportation, water resources, and facility maintenance. This is what uh, Streets Division does in Santa Barbara, so if there's people out there that don't understand what we do, and this is part of Measure D, this is exactly what we do. You pay us to fix streets, that's what we do. Which means that 33 operating programs that Public Works oversee affect more than one part of your daily routine. We care a lot about what we do, and I just, you know, I think it's nice to know that the people can be sure that we're up here and we're doing our job right, and we're keeping their water safe for them to drink. To get an idea of how the Public Works Department affects your daily life, all you need to do is go to your sink. The water that comes from the tap 
has been treated at the Cater Water Treatment Facility. The water that goes down the drain will be treated at the El Estero Waste Water Treatment Plant. So far this year, the Public Works Department has completed many projects, including the new Teen Center, the Granada Garage, the Milpis Beautification Project, and the Sheffield Reservoir. National Public Works Week celebrates the men and women who work hard to maintain our infrastructure and services that are collectively known as Public Works. This year's theme, Public Works Moving Life Forward, reminds us that even here in Santa Barbara, it is our dedicated employees that work to move our community forward. Instituted as a public education campaign by the American Public Works Association in 1960, National Public Works Week calls attention to the importance of public works in community life. And we're going to recognize the employees with a, a little event where they get a chance to get together, have a, a lunch, and we're going to talk about some of the things they've done throughout the year. We'll, we'll have some displays that will be up about some of their most significant achievements this year. And we'll get a chance to maybe view a little of history. We always have some historical photos, and, and it's just kind of interesting to remember a while. Even in the 1920s, we were having the same kind of issues that we have today. The only really different is the people, and some of the clothes, and some of the, the, the stuff that they used was, was different. But it, it's the same group of dedicated people doing those types of things today as we did in the early part of the century. Public Works is the city's largest department, representing about 41% of the city's total budget. The department makes up about 26% of the city's permanent workforce. Well, for many years, the county courthouse has been the center of judicial business. So many people take advantage of this beautiful area. Oftentimes, concerts and weddings are held here. And just last month, about 8,700 people filled the sunken gardens to take part in the annual Earth Day celebration. Christie's Wiki takes us there. We only have one planet, and sometimes it takes a dramatic event to make us aware of the delicate balance of our environment. In 1969, Union Oil Company's Platform A leaked over 200,000 gallons of crude oil into the Pacific Ocean. Following a visit to Santa Barbara's oil-drenched coastline, Senator Gaylord Nelson got the idea for a nationwide teach-in on the environment. On April 22, 1970, Earth Day was born. Thirty-seven years later, the consciousness-raising event continues, this time with the theme Global warming, change begins with learning. People are very much wanting to know what it is that they can do, um, how they can shift their energy use, um, what, what personal actions they can take. And Earth Day is an excellent opportunity to reach out to people and talk about thinking globally and acting locally. This is the one day of the year where I get to see all of our friends and associates and people who are aligned behind saving planet Earth. And I think that Santa Barbara really does have a, a very important role to play in all of that. And so when, when I come out here and I look at all the different um, booths and the people that I know and all the things that are going on, I'm so proud of Santa Barbara. With an emphasis on personal action, the festival offered 150 different booths with displays of renewable energy technologies, conservation techniques, and environmentally friendly products. We have a, a new campaign called the Get Energized Campaign, and the idea is that you actually sign a pledge to say, I'm going to do these things to change my lifestyle a little bit, hopefully save money doing it, and also help mitigate climate change. Do you want to spin the wheel? One organization in particular has made great strides towards becoming an environmental leader. The city is leading in so many ways in environmental sustainability. Our city fleet is running on biodiesel. We've just adopted a green building policy for city facilities. We're doing a lot in recycling, composting in all of our city buildings. We're retrofitting many of our water fixtures so that we're saving water. And so we're very proud of these achievements. Our fire truck got a lot of people asking the firefighter about it. And the reason is because there's a big sign on it and it says, this fire truck works on biodiesel. And people were amazed because they know that the city is not going to compromise their safety. You know, we, we want to make sure the fire truck can get there. And we are comfortable enough with biodiesel that we put it there. 2007 marked the start of a new partnership between the Community Environmental Council and the UCSB Donald Bren School for Environmental Science and Management, which co-hosted the event. The CC has been around since the 
late 70s starting recycling and now they started a whole new initiative, Fossil Free in 33, to innovate energy use in the county. And the Bren School is designed to solve environmental problems on a regional, global, and local scale. And so we bring technical expertise from the university, and they bring fantastic community engagement. So it merges um, basically people power and educational power. Well, the rain hasn't stopped thousands of people from coming to this year's Earth Day. The biggest draw is a photography exhibit by Howard Ruby. It shows one of the sad side effects of global warming, an entire species literally on thin ice. I went up one time and saw the uh, plight of the polar bear and realized that if the polar bear went, that that would mean that we're all in trouble. Well, now there seems to be a firestorm and everybody is all excited about polar bears and global warming. And what we're here to do is to make sure that this is not a fad. This leads to a paradigm shift in consciousness. The polar bears on thin ice are a symbol for our need to change the world to less carbon dioxide emissions. As Arctic sea ice continues to melt, the fragile habitat of the polar bears is threatened. With the average American burning 8.2 tons of oil per year and the average household producing 6 tons of carbon dioxide per year, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that humans are damaging our planet. Average temperatures have risen at almost twice the rate of the rest of the world in the past few decades, and the Arctic ice has shrunk 42 percent in just 40 years. As the ice melts back, then there's less time for them to be on the ice, and that's where we are right now, with at least three and a half weeks shorter period of time than they had just 10 years ago, and it's fading fast. While the plight of the polar bears and our planet may seem overwhelming, we can make choices in our everyday lives that have an impact on the world we live in. You can make a difference in shifting your own lifestyle, and even in small ways. And I think it's an empowerment, and to some degree also a celebration. There are a lot of things that need to be changed, that we need to work on, but there are a lot of things that we are doing right, and Earth Day is just an opportunity to get together and celebrate that. I've got seven grandchildren, and I want them to have such a luxurious and lovely life as I have. And this, I believe, can be best done, in my case, training students to be the next generation of environmental leaders. The problems are, are important, not just for us here in Santa Barbara, but for the world at large. I work in Africa, I work in Brazil, and I see the really serious problems those people face. And so I, you, see, you see people in need and you, and you try to help them. I am an optimist. Now, we can take two sides right now. We can say, oh, there's nothing to do about global warming. I think we can do something. I choose to believe that there is something that we can do because what is the alternative? So I think activity and trying our best, whether it's turning off light bulbs or, or whether it's planting a tree, we all have to do something. For more information on Earth Day, visit the CEC's website at communityenvironmentalcouncil.org. Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara here from the County Courthouse. We hope you'll join us next time. If you have any questions or comments about our show, give us a call at City TV at 564-5311. Or catch us on our website at citytv18.com. I'm your host, Rachel Senes, and remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara.